who are everybody's new to KW Philadelphia, but not necessarily new to real estate. So we got um, 14 years, okay, uh, less than one year. So let's just uh, um, do this as if it's a mix, all right? We've got some people who've been doing this a long time. Let me uh, give you a quick background on me, Jim Goldstein, Finance of America. Um, I'm an old dude that's been doing this for a long, long time, 33 plus years in the mortgage business. So I wanna bring a little bit of perspective to uh, the conversation and um, talk a little bit about general stuff, but I also at the end of the call wanna give you a little bit of a rundown of what we're seeing today from the lending side um, and 33 years in the business. Some of the things that I'm seeing are unprecedented. So um, hopefully that will be helpful for you all. Yep, and I'm seeing some more in the chat box. We've got some people brand new, less than a year, uh, more than two, almost eight it is definitely more than two and 14. So we got a total mix. Um, so my goal is going to be to give you info that um, is going to be appropriate for everybody. And I am going to work off of a uh, PowerPoint that um, that we have sharing my screen. Um, everybody hopefully is seeing my screen, maybe throw in the chat box just to encourage me. Let me know that you are seeing my screen. And I'm uh, going to run, th run through uh, some basics. Alyssa can't be here. Alyssa is actually uh, on another Zoom call. Um, but uh, she has fully empowered me to send this information out to you all. So um, what are we going to cover? Uh, I'm going to go through this kind of quick and um, make sure everybody knows you can reach me uh, at uh, jgoldstein at financeofamerica.com. Uh, any follow-up questions? So we're all kind of sequestered. Um, that's a little bit of the bad news, but the good news is that fully available. And I wanna let you know that um, if you ever need us to be with you on a Zoom call, if you ever want to just connect this way to go over a scenario, if you ever wanted to set us up with a buyer consult, or you thought it'd be a good idea to have a lender with you, uh, Alyssa and I are uh, all set for that, just set it up. So um, what we're trying to do is give you an overview. This is our Mortgage 101, uh, the basic timeline. What happens when you first meet with somebody, uh, getting the pre-approval in place, starting the home search, and then what happens under contract. So from the full timeline, what does that look like on the mortgage side? Um, pre-approval is the name of the game. Um, if you do not have a buyer uh, that's pre-approved, I'm not sure why you would be putting them in a car to look at properties. Um, the idea is let's get the financing in place, let's get the money solidified, uh, and that's gonna have uh, some very positive effects. The first thing it's gonna do is it's gonna qualify your borrower. You're gonna know exactly where they fit price point wise, not gonna waste time looking at prices, properties that are out of their price range or below uh, you know, what they can qualify for on houses that aren't really gonna fill the bill for them. Um, the second thing it does in my mind, which is equally important, is that uh, obviously you need your pre-approval letter when you're gonna make your offer, so you're in position for that. Um, and I think it takes, from an emotional standpoint, it takes a lot of the stress out of the home buying process, especially first time buyers. Uh, you know, they, They're nervous about it, understandably so. It's a big financial decision. And if you get them qualified, they know that they're rock solid, they know that they're well within their affordability range. We have this crazy idea, maybe they could actually enjoy the home buying process. So that, that's the, uh, those are the goals behind the pre-approval. Um, like I said, I've been doing this a long time and uh, the good part now is how quickly we can get a pre-approval in place. Um, I've definitely been on the phone with people and then within 30 minutes we had them pre-approved. Can't promise that on everybody, especially if they're self-employed. But if you've got a pay, two pay stubs, uh, W-2 uh, borrowers that have uh, a couple bank accounts, it's really easy to get them uh, pre-approved quickly. So typically, what are we gonna ask for? We're gonna ask for two years of employment history. We're gonna want their most recent W-2s if they're salaried. We're gonna want their tax returns if they are self-employed. Um, we're gonna want a month's worth of recent pay stubs, and we're gonna want two months worth of bank statements. So uh, that's, the, that's the doc set that we're looking for. That's uh, usually pretty easy to get. 
we send them a secure link, they can uh, upload it easily and securely into uh, our system. <clears throat> you may hear the term pre-qualification, um, pre-approval versus pre-qualification. Pre-approval is the whole nine yards. We're running their credit, we're checking their documentation, we're putting them through our underwriting system, we're obtaining a, an approval. Pre-qualification is usually a conversation. Where do you work? How much do you make? May not even involve a credit check. So pre-qualification is not worth the paper that it's written on. What you're looking for in all cases, I would say, is a pre-approval. Um, I'll try and keep an eye on the chat box. So if, uh, if anybody has any questions as we're going along, throw them in the chat and we'll be happy to uh, take care of that for you. So why are we getting all this information? We're trying to make sure that the borrower qualifies in several ways. First is their debt to income ratio. We want to make sure that the amount of money that they make on a monthly basis, gross monthly income, is sufficient to cover the debt that they're going to have. And we're going to look at two things. How, uh, is there enough income to cover the mortgage that they're going to be getting? And is there enough income to cover the mortgage plus their other obligations. I like to think of myself as a debt manager. Sometimes I will uh, be working with somebody on a pre-approval and it turns out that they've got some, uh, they're trying, they're thinking about putting a lot of money down, uh, but they've got some bad credit card debt. So sometimes we can kind of clean up their budget profile uh, while we're going through the pre-approval. A little bit of a side note. So just a quick example for those of you who are new to the business, what we're talking about. Um, if you have somebody who is trying to take on a uh, mortgage payment of $2,000 a month, and they have about 500, they have $500 worth of other obligations. So their, uh, their total debt obligation is $2,500 a month. And they make $6,500 a month. Then their debt to income ratio, that's this $2,500 total debt, against their 6,500 income is 0.38 or 38%. 38% is sweet, they're, uh, they're in the sweet zone. Um, generally, you're trying to keep debt to income to about 45. So just a quick uh, example. This is what a pre-approval letter looks like. It's gonna be a letter telling them that they've received an approval. It's gonna specify the purchase price, the amount of the loan, what type of loan we qualified them for, going to have an expiration date um, and it's going to basically uh, say that if anything changes like if you're uh, if you lose your job or things like that that the letter's not valid but this is what you're going to submit with your offer and uh, that can give the seller and the seller's agent uh, the assurance of knowing that these people did their homework uh, and had their financing in place you know I usually say it like this um, if you're buying a house for three hundred thousand and you're going to borrow 285,000 of that 300,000, probably a pretty good idea to make sure that you can get the 285. So you get them pre-approved, uh, then they know their price point, you start to show them houses, the home search begins. Um, that's, that's basically the next step. Um, you guys who are first contact with buyers, uh, some very good information for you that where you can uh, kind of give some guidance and counseling. I think this is gonna make you look good in the eyes of your buyer. Um, these are some things that you want to advise some do's and some don'ts for your, your buyer customers. Do. Um, if, uh, the, where the, we need to know where the money's coming from. If they're, if they're planning on taking you know, uh, $1,000 that they have hidden under the mattress, we need to know that. We're going to have to find a way to work around that to make sure that all the money that's going into the transaction is coming from acceptable sources. Pay your, bill, pay your bills on time, you know, that, uh, stay current on your monthly debts. Um, don't hurt your credit at this, you know, critical window where your credit's getting looked at to see if you qualify for the house. Um, keep making monthly payments in your normal pattern. So if you normally make the minimum on a credit card, keep doing that. I would say don't, I would say it to this, uh, this way to your customer, don't make any dramatic changes in the way you're doing things without first talking to uh, your lender and see how that will impact. Sometimes people, um, they'll have a, uh, a collection account and they decide to pay the collection account off because they know they're planning to buy a house. Sometimes when you pay off a collection account, it can actually lower your FICO score. So how credit works sometimes can be counterintuitive. Uh, you know, the, the basic guidance is here's some do's and don'ts and don't do anything dramatically one way or another without talking to the lender that you're gonna be working with. Um, 
keep track of all deposits. So we have to track uh, the source of the money. Uh, we have to create, I call it a paper trail. So if you're gonna be making any large deposits, if you're gonna be getting a gift, if you're gonna be taking money out of your 401k plan, if you're gonna be uh, you know, doing any of a number of things around uh, money, keep a paper trail. And again, talk to the lender before you do anything. Um, and then here's some don'ts. Don't make any big lifestyle changes like quitting your job. <laughs> Duh. Um, don't take out any new loans. Um, big purchases are going to hurt your debt ratio. Uh, don't close or open uh, new credit cards. Uh, big, deposits, big deposits or withdrawals. And moving money around, it won't cause a problem with your approval. It just creates a lot of extra paperwork for you. So um, these are some good lists for you to have when you're doing your buyer consult. I think it sets you uh, as a, a good um, source of information when you share this right up front with your with your buyers and you're the first ones in front of them so maybe you could avert a disaster by giving them this information okay I don't think I see any questions in the chat box at this point in time so let me just double check that yep no we're good so I'm going to just keep rolling um, submitting an offer obviously I think that this is uh, all goes without saying um, we typically, you're going to have a pre-approval letter with your offer. We like to match the pre-approval to the offer. Uh, we think strategically, even if somebody is qualified for five hundred thousand, um, but they're but they're the offer is going to be two ninety. Um, just let the sellers and the seller's agent know that they're qualified for the offer that they're going to be able to make. A lot of times, what I do is somebody, let's say somebody wants to go in at two ninety, but it's a three hundred ask. Um, and they know that if if they need to go to 300, they're they're going or they're willing to do that. So we'll send the agent and the customer a, a pre-approval at 290 and and one at 300. And you can go in with the 290. And then if there's a counter and the seller's agent says give you know up, give me an updated pre-approval, you've got that 300 thousand dollar pre-approval in your back pocket. <clears throat> doesn't take us any time. Once we have these people built in our system, switching it up uh, is no problem at all. Okay, so you're under contract um, and the, you send the contract over. On your side, you're ordering the inspections. What happens on our side is we're starting the process. Quick quick word about Finance of America. We Our ops team is local. Our, um, normally, they all sit in the same office. So um, the, the loan opener, the loan processor, the loan underwriter, and the loan closer all sit in close proximity to each other. Um, Finance of America went fully remote over the last really month. All of our processing uh, operations, all of our people are working remotely, so they're all safe. And we had a record-breaking month in uh, March. We closed more loans than we ever have before. So all the technology is in place. Thank goodness for the technology that we have, which enables us to accomplish all these tasks remotely, which many years ago we would not have been able to do. So um, we, we, we order our appraisal, we submit the file, um, we, um, con we, we connect with title, um, we, uh, the, the loan officer originates the full file, sends it over to the processor. The processor verifies all the information, they get in touch with the employer, whatever is necessary to, to be done, and they prep the file, which they hand to the, uh, off to the underwriter. And then the underwriter uh, reviews everything. Once the appraisal comes in, they clear that. Um, and I th any, any of you who've been in the business are very familiar with the standard process. Let me take a, a minute to just familiarize, since everybody I think is relatively new to uh, KW Philadelphia. KW Philadelphia has three in-house lending companies, three in-house mortgage companies, Finance of America, Animac, and Garden State Home Loans. So it's a nice setup for you guys. You've got three different companies. All are very, very legitimate, credible, uh, good people. All of the originators are experienced. They know what they're doing. And, uh, you know, the, their relationship is at stake uh, it's a giant account for us. You know, we're really compelled to do an, a, a really, really good job uh, each and every time that a KW agent, uh, you know, brings a deal to us. So that's kind of good. There's like this little, a little bit of extra pressure to make sure that we do a super job. 
And it would be great for me if I could tell you that Garden State and Annie Mac are not good, because then we would be the only good ones, but that would absolutely not be the truth. Garden State Home Loans, awesome. Annie Mac does a great job. Finance of America, I think we're pretty good too. So just keeping going. Um, you get your mortgage commitment letter. There's usually some conditions of the approval. We work together to get those uh, cleared and get the loan into clear to close status. And then um, that loan gets handed off to our closer. The closer uh, pre prepares the closing disclosure. They work together with the title company. We put the numbers together. We uh, get that out to the borrower for signature and um, <clears throat> the loan closes. I think this is probably a pretty good time to talk about some of the differences that are happening right now with COVID-19 uh, affecting all of our lives and all of our livelihoods. So um, on April 6th, and I think, so that's this Monday, um, we are launching a what's called a hybrid e-closing uh, process. What that means is that when it's time to uh, get the closing papers signed, we're gonna send them to the borrower for their electronic signature. They're gonna be able to electronically sign all of the documents with the exception of the mortgage, the note, and maybe one other document. So what it, what it will do is it will take the timeline that's needed to close a, a purchase loan down from, you know, call it, they're usually between a half an hour and an hour to fully uh, um, complete all the paperwork on the buy side. Uh, that should be 10 minutes now. So it's going to dramatically reduce the amount of time that's necessary. There is still going to be the need for an in-person closing, um, and there's still going to be documents that have to be signed and notarized. That's called the hybrid e-close. Um, Finance of America is launching that on Monday. Um, we are also in the process of uh, uh, positioning ourselves for a full um, electronic uh, closing where everything's gonna be able to be done with, it's called RON, R-O-N, Remote Online Notary. And in this process, what we're gonna be able to do is video conference, close. Nobody will have to be face-to-face, -face, um, and we'll be able to complete the, close, uh, the closing transaction with video conferencing um, and remote notarization of the documents. So we're not there yet, this was something that we thought was about a year or a year and a half away, but due to COVID-19, um, all the agencies that are involved in, in really putting something like that together um, have accelerated the process. And uh, we're being told that second quarter of 2009, uh, 2020, this year, is our target uh, date and an achievable date for that. So just uh, something that's on the horizon, which I think is interesting. Um, and then the closer puts the closing package together, sends the docs out, um, waits for the uh, funding docs to come over and funds the loan. Closing happens. Everybody makes a commission. We all live happily ever after. So that's basically the gist of it. Um, I want to, uh, I guess, see if you if there's any questions um, let me get out of the share and just kind of check check in with you all and see if you have any questions anybody All right, let's see. Nothing, I don't see anything here in West Philly. Any questions about, oh, here we go. Due to COVID-19, are there any changes with FHA credit re requirements? That's from Parisha. Yeah, Parisha, answer is yes. So um, today from uh, 11 to 12, we had an all company call. Um, let me give you some quick background on what's happening in uh, mortgage world. So I'm sure most of you saw yesterday, <clears throat> today, uh, we got the unemployment figures for this past week. 6.6 .6 million people filed for unemployment last week. Before this, before this month, the most that had ever filed for unemployment in one week was a little bit under 700,000. 
So in the last two weeks, 10 million people have uh, filed for unemployment. Um, what that means is that there is greater risk to lenders that they're going to lend to somebody who is going to be unable to make their payment. And what lenders do in the face of potential greater risk is they tighten guidelines. So um, a couple, probably the most significant, there's two changes that um, I see as the most significant changes and that are important for uh, agents to be aware of. The first one is with regard to FICO score requirements. So. Um, every company um, has the ability to either just follow the standard guidelines or set some additional restrictions in place. Prior to, uh, prior to today, um, Finance of America would, uh, would work with FHA borrowers uh, down to a 580 FICO score. Um, today, we raised that requirement to 620. So to answer your question, Benicia, yes. Um, the new uh, guideline minimum FICO score for FHA loans and VA loans is um, 620. Um, I think it's also important to note that when you um, compare those guidelines from one lender to another, um, there's more fragmentation in the market right now. Um, lenders are reacting, um, you know, at different um, I guess different velocities, I'll call it, to, to this situation than others. <clears throat> Excuse me again, sorry about that. It's not whiskey, but it's gonna have to do for now. So we've seen some other lenders going to 660 on their minimum FICO requirement. We've seen 640, we've seen 680. Why is that important to know as an agent? You could be uh, in the middle of a deal where uh, when, the, when the lender took the application, the borrower qualified, now they don't. And, um, but that borrower, let's say they have a 640 FICO score, um, they, you may be able to find a home for them with a different lender. So that was always the case to some degree, but um, not really much. Now uh, the, um, the requirements have recently changed for pretty much every lender that I know of. So it's a really great question and uh, hopefully that information is helpful. Now I mentioned that there's two, uh, two changes. The other thing that has changed is that typically when we run a credit report, that credit report is good for 120 days. So if I took a credit uh, on somebody in February, in the beginning of February, March, April, May, I was able to close them all the way into June. Um, the agencies, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and FHA basically have given us guidance that that should change to 60 days. So credit reports are now good for 60 days. So it's going to be very important for your lenders to be you know, cognizant of that and working. I had one, I have a purchase closing with one of the KW folks that's closing um, on April 16th. And we ran this guy's credit on February 11th, which was going to be fine. Um, so, so I talked to the customer today, asked him if to his knowledge there would be any hiccups that had happened on his credit since uh, February 11th. He said no. Um, we, we ran his new credit over on the side, kind of where nobody could see it. His credit score went from 732 to 733, so he's fine. But it's something that based on this changing environment, we did have to run a new credit on him. Thankfully, you know, everything was fine for him. So those are a couple of things, and, and I said that I wanted to touch base a little bit on COVID. Um, those are a couple of things to, to be aware of. Um, so I have a client who is out of work until the shutdown is lifted. Would the amount of paychecks she would need to be the same, or should he wait a bit longer to apply? So if somebody is, um, can't uh, work, currently is out of work, um, you're not, you're not going to be able to get a mortgage. Uh, they're not going to be able to get a mortgage until they're back to work. We were talking about this on, on our call. Actually, the head of underwriting has, uh, his brother works at a company now, the, but the company is, is shuttered, but the company has all their employees working remotely and the employees are continuing to be paid. That person is fine for obtaining a mortgage. But if you're, on a, if you're out of work um, and your company is shut down and you are not getting paid, you're unemployed. You're not gonna be able to get a mortgage until such time 
as you're back to work. So not the answer any of us wants to hear, but I think if you think of it from a, uh, you know, from a lending standpoint, um, how do we know when that company's gonna open back up, when or if that company's gonna open back up? And if they don't, that person would be unable to make their mortgage payment. So these are the kinds of situations that we're all running into. Um, you know, I'm curious if somebody would type in the box, how is, um, how is the activity? I guess my understanding is that um, you really are unable to do showings. Um, if somebody wants to buy a house, um, uh, how, how do we? How are we handling that? How are we? Uh, how are we selling real estate these days? Really, I guess is my question. And again, if you if you can open up your mic and want to open up your mic, um, I guess I, I'm only asking the question because if there's if there's any way uh, that we can help with uh, just creating a little bit more confidence. I think your, you know, I think your buyers, any of any potential buyers who are very um, solid in their employment situation, um, they should really position themselves to take advantage of the, their strength. Um, and anything that we can do to help with that, we are here for that. The, um, you know, they're, 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 the market has changed and there's, there's the buyer pool um, is being impacted. So if you're a strong buyer today, you may be really uh, positioned to take advantage of real estate opportunities. I guess this is the way that I would say it. Um, any other questions? If you have any other questions, either jump on the mic or uh, throw something in the chat box. Um, I don't see anything coming in. So, I'm gonna join Gavin in some liquid refreshment. Cheers, everybody. Hang in there, stay safe, be well, have a good evening.